Chris, you were mentioning in another interview that you did um, that there, like you have the lar- like South Africa has the largest database of sort of like an indiv- of individual sightings of great whites. Is that is that true? Um, well, I, yeah, I don't know about the individual sightings. What we certainly have the largest database of where we worked was of, of natural predatory events. So with our work at Seal Island in False Bay, from the very first day I went out there in 1996 till the present, um, and sadly when the White Sharks left there in, in 2018, we kept data on every single day. So we, we had a database of more than 10,400 predatory events, which cumulatively was more, many times more than the rest of the world put together. And that was just from one location. But, um, you know, f- fin IDs have been quite commonplace for a long time as a passive way of getting to know, you know, the identity of a local population and a very non-invasive way of seeing, you know, what ties they have between other adjacent areas. So that was a, a very popular way of, of photographing and, and getting to know individuals within a population between different localities and, and being able to compare them and, and do a very rough sort of popula- population dynamic study. Um, you know, that, that people that weren't necessarily scientifically or academically qualified could certainly get involved with a, and help because, you know, a good photo, if it's taken by somebody who's never been to school or somebody that's got a doctorate at the end of the day, does exactly the same thing. So, you know, I think that was certainly a, a way that the, your your average citizen scientist could get involved. And, you know, I think also it was very interesting. We learned a lot of things from those photo IDs in so much as, you know, the, the fins didn't stay looking the same as they, they started out in life. And you kind of, the fin is a is almost a, a fingerprint of the animal's life. You know, it carries injuries, it accumulates them, much like we do battle wounds through our life. They, ha- they have a certain parasite load on them. And it, it was very interesting watching how those fins developed their own character over the years as well. So a very large part of what we did with, with our company at, at Seal Island in False Bay was um, non-invasive studies. I used to tag sharks a lot, but over time, my own opinion became that, you know, if we're not doing a huge amount to conserve the animals through all the tagging we're doing, um, let's not put extra pressure on them because those tags often get overgrown. They, they cause deformities. There, there are all sorts of reasons why I stopped tagging them eventually. None more so than, you know, was the juice worth, worth the squeeze at the end of the day? But the, the non-invasive stuff where you're just out there every day recording what's going on, you don't think it's important at the time. But if you record consistently a lot of data over time, it really builds up unbelievable patterns that if you'd asked me 30 years ago, I would have said, well, jeepers, I would never have thought that would reveal this or this would reveal that. And most importantly, time is so important when you're recording data, because if you do a study over one year or two years, it essentially reveals a snapshot of something's life. And if management decisions are based on that, it's, it's, it's extremely dangerous. You know, I wasn't the same person today as I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. We change over life. And if you're keeping detailed data over a huge population, you can see those changes. You can see how those animals feed in different areas, how they do different things, how they inter- interact with different individuals. And by keeping large databases purely of observational data, provided it's done consistently, um, it's it's vitally important, and it certainly can contribute towards science, you know, in a, in its own way. And um, I think, yeah, you know, it's very low impact for the animals as well. So it's it's win win all around. Absolutely, and I think yeah. capturing a predatory event's got to be pretty exciting as well when you're, you know, when you're in there and you're and you're watching these things happen. Uh, do you remember your first? you know, capture of a predatory event from, from a white shark? You know, I hate to say I don't. And, that, and that's really weird. I've never actually been asked that question before. And if you ask me my first predatory event I ever saw, um, no, I can't. Um, I can remember, I, I can remember, I could graphically tell you about, and when I say graphically, I don't mean the gory details, but I could graphically tell you about hundreds and I could easily go back to my data books and tell you exactly what that first one looked like. But um, natural predation for me was was the greatest privilege I've ever had working with animals, watching 
those life and death struggles every day and developing a respect for both predator and prey. And as strange as it may seem from having seen nearly 10 and a half thousand of them, um, I became softer over time. Not that I was ever <laughs> bloodthirsty by any stretch, but you know, I, I, I just had an incredibly healthy respect for the fact that I was watching life and death in front of me. And um, that seal's life was as, as important as mine to that seal. And that shark getting that meal was as important as me getting my next meal. In fact, a lot more important because I probably have a lot more meals than that shark did. So, um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was an incredible and humbling privilege to have spent so much time um, watching how these animals fought for their survival, learning about those predatory behaviors, learning about the strengths of the sharks and the strength of the seals. And incredibly, over all that time, the sharks had a 49.6% success rate. So, so call, it, call it exactly 50%. And, you know, the sharks had the speed and they, they had the, the incredible, incredible power, whereas the sharks, the seals really had the uh, abil uh, agility and endurance. So you, you had this in beautiful balance that, that showed itself through, through all the seasons with very little variances. And that's one of the amazing things, you know, the way, whether you're working with terrestrial animals or you're working with marine animals, is that in nature, virtually always, there's a, there's a lovely balance. And that's why ecosystems work. You know, everything's kind of in tune with, with each other. I was going to Absolutely. add that it's really seed one of these uh, predation events, when, especially when it's like not, not staged, which you have. It's, it's, it's incredible compared to like sometimes they'll, you know, you'll see things that are staged or they'll show things on like some of these documentaries. But to see one of these things just a lot, just happen naturally it's it's just an incredible an incredible event and it's it's very it's it, you, you found a really unique area there in false bay where you're able to go out and you can kind of with some high degree of certainty you can you can determine what times of the year that you're likely to see these different predation events when you go out to like uh, seal island yeah absolutely so dave you know historically and I, and I hate to use the past tense because um sadly it doesn't happen anymore and we'll probably get onto that but uh, it was usually in our winter months. So South African winter months are April through to August. You know, that's our late autumn or fall. And then we go to our early spring, which is around about September. And, you know, on one day in 2012, we recorded 46 predatory events, which was more than the second highest place in the world, the Farallon Islands, in an entire year. So, yeah, you know, seeing, seeing those predatory events was amazing. And... You know, sadly, um, I was always really pushing with the documentary crews to film more of it and, and take less of the human side of what was going on out there because really we're irrelevant in that picture. The sharks are so sensational and sexy. You don't need idiots like me or other people in these shows. And yeah, it was just a very difficult behavior to capture because like when I'm shooting it from a still photogra photographic point of view, You've got a subject in the sharks that is camouflaged. It's underwater. You don't know where this animal is. Then the prey moves irregularly on the surface, and at one minute it's here, another second it's there, and so it goes. Then you're on an unstable environment, and you've got elements like salt spray and wind all competing against you. So it was very difficult, and those natural predations, you know, last sometimes if it's one strike, it's one second. But if you're lucky, you know, the shark, lucky for us from a spectator point of view, if the shark missed in that initial strike, you could get these incredible dances where the one is trying to line up the other one and the seal's trying to get as close to the shark behind the mouth as it can so the shark can't line it up. And those battles could go on sometimes for three, four, five, even ten minutes. And there were some occasions where we saw four different sharks try catch the same seal. So this tiny seal, young of the year, six, seven months of age, would evade one shark. And you, you need to think about that. Six to seven months of age, and it's taking on the most formidable predator in the ocean. And it has got the presence of mind to know not to race to get back to the island in a straight line because the shark's quicker than it, but to get as close to its the the ultimate enemy as it possibly can so it would evade this one shark literally bouncing off its snout 
the shark would be, become fatigued, disappear, and then it would go and 100 yards on another shark would go at it. And it would manage to get away from that shark. And so it would go. And eventually, 50 meters from the island, a shark would take it out. And, you know, these were the things that were very emotional to watch because you can't but have empathy and um, a sense of remorse almost to see an animal that has defied death, you know, so in such an accomplished way, you know, falling short at the last hurdle. You know, and then there were those amazing encounters where, you know, you watch a seal literally balancing on the snout of a five meter or 15 foot great white and it gets away from that one, another one flicks it through the air and then literally just before the rocks, the great white has a go, go at it and then it climbs back up onto the island. And it's like this, this incredible hallelujah Olympic gold medalist, you know, feeling.